bison and prairie dogs coexisted for thousands of years. The ecological role of these large herbivores with prairie dogs is such that they actually can have a mutualistic relationship. Why is it important for prairie dogs to be restored to their native habitat? Biologist Dr. Anna Davidson and Petunia join us to share insights about the ecology of New Mexico's grasslands and the importance of reestablishing this keystone species. What I realize is they're among the most important, but yet among the most hated animals. They parallel the story of wolves. Stem cells are great cells, everybody has them, and they're basically cells that haven't committed to what they want to be when they grow up. And so if you have a source of stem cells, then you can make them and direct them to become any type of tissue that you want. Can human bone and heart valves be grown in the laboratory? Dr. Elizabeth Dirk explains how medicine is being reinvented through research into self-renewing stem cells that acts as a repair system for the human body. So if I can get a population of stem cells, I can you know, direct them to become bone, or I can direct them to become part of the heart valve. We've designed a program that prepares students for a career in engineering, using the race car as a focus. How does building a race car help UNM engineering students achieve career goals? Welcome to Connect, where each month we connect with the great people and inspired thinking found at the University of New Mexico. Connect is next. Joining me is Dr. Anna Davidson and her little furry friend, Petunia, and Petunia is a prairie dog. We do know that prairie dogs are not normally given to this kind of handling from people, so this is an unusual situation, right, Anna? Yes, very much so. This little guy is a rescue animal and used for education because he's uh, very friendly, but that's very rare. He's a Gunnison's prairie dog, and Gunnison's, they occur throughout the Four Corners region which includes um, Santa Fe and Albuquerque area, so he's a local prairie dog. Why do you think it's important to restore prairie dogs to their native land? Because they're considered to be keystone species. Keystone species are those species that are very important in an ecosystem. And so these guys are native to grassland ecosystems. They transform grassland landscapes. Um, they create a unique habitat for all kinds of other grassland animals and they provide a really important food resource for all suites of um, predators. If suddenly there weren't prairie dogs in the bigger picture, there would be a problem. A keystone species is one that um, is also irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. So they have a large and really important effect on an ecosystem. So what happens is when they are lost from an ecosystem, that has a cascading effect. So when prairie dogs decline in an area, the predators that associate with them also decline. The animals that are dependent on the habitats they create also decline. One of the most notable is the black-footed ferret. There were 13 left in the wild in the 1980s. Because of the decline of prairie dogs, black-footed ferrets rely on prairie dogs for over 90% of their diet. And so they have become one of North America's most endangered mammals. So this is a really interesting um, part of the story is that the Fish and Wildlife Service has put in a large amount of effort and funding, millions of dollars, into this recovery program for the black-footed ferret. But yet, they are running out of significant enough habitat for them to reestablish their populations in because there's not significant large populations of prairie dog colonies so left. might not work. We need unfenced. large <laughs> unfenced areas that um, can support predator populations like the black-footed ferret. And when the government is putting in all of these resources to restore the ferret populations, but yet they are also putting in funds to reduce prairie dog populations. These two efforts are in complete yeah. conflict. Because they provide unique habitat for all kinds of species and important prey for many species, they increase overall biodiversity. And they also, because they're providing a unique environment, so they're colonies, they act like islands, unique islands of grassland habitat. 
dotted across the landscape. I would never have thought if somebody mentioned that there were keystone species that prairie dogs were among those. So that's interesting to me, but also what are some other keystone species? Some examples of keystone species would include predators like wolves. So predators help to, through their trophic interactions, they help to maintain the balance of the ecosystem by affecting the prey abundance and then the prey's effect on the rest of the ecosystem. So they have this top-down effect and are really important in ecosystems. That way, burrowing mammals like prairie dogs are another kind of keystone species and that's because they play this role um, through their trophic effects. For example, grazing um, grassland vegetation. They modify the um, nutrient quality uh, of the grassland, which attracts um, bison to their colonies and even cattle to their colonies wow. um, by increasing the nutrition in the vegetation. Are they at risk? Yes, their populations have declined about 98% across their former range. So prairie dogs occur across the central grasslands of North America from Canada to Mexico. Hmm. And there's five different species of prairie dogs, all of which are uh, threatened, endangered, or declining and have declined significantly. 98%, wow. Well, a lot of people think that prairie dogs are still really abundant because where they because they see them all the time and that's often because we're seeing them along highway medians within cities where they remain right. but out in the broad grassland landscapes they are largely absent and that is because of um, widespread extermination programs that have gone on since the early 1900s those efforts still continue today but not to the same degree as that they used to be in the early 1900s. That was designed to be mass eradication. Now it's more about controlling their populations. But you're also, saying that's not necessarily a good thing. No, absolutely not. Because they play this important role in these ecosystems, their presence is really essential, particularly at the landscape scale. Because of what I was describing, mm -hmm. how prairie dogs provide these important habitats across that landscape mm -hmm. and provide really important prey for many predators, they need to occur in a large in large numbers Got it. across okay. that landscape in order to play their keystone role. And you have a diagram that sort of yes. explains that. And what are we exactly. seeing in the diagram exactly? The bottom of the diagram shows the colonies and how they would look like these little islands of habitat across the greater la grassland landscape. And then the, the middle one shows what a colony is like. And then the top one shows what a mound is like, a soil mound. And what's really neat to think about is that these little mounds, they provide their own unique habitat as well. So all kinds of invertebrates, so um, different kinds of bugs will associate with those mounds so essentially, these mounds act like colonies. Prairie dogs and bison got along for thousands of years. Yeah. And then along come cattle and sheep, mixing up that kind of delicate balance we're talking about. Tell me about that. Well, this is a really important point, that cattle and prairie dogs are perceived to be um, competitors in grassland ecosystems. But yet, as you say, bison and prairie dogs coexisted for thousands of years. and the ecological role of these large herbivores like bison and cattle with prairie dogs is such that they, they actually can have a mutualistic relationship. What it is, is that prairie dogs benefit from these large grazers opening up the grassland habitat. Mm. By doing so, the prairie dogs can see predators better. And so their colonies will thrive in areas that have been opened up by these large herbivores. Suddenly I'm getting this view that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on out there that we just don't know about. And the more we discover about their re ecological relationships with other animals and, and the entire ecosystem, the more we see how important they are. It's just wild to think about a tiny little prairie dog yes. and a bison. Well, they co-evolved with yes. one another. And so when bison have been removed from much of North America, by, they've been replaced by cattle. And so now cattle are having this similar kind of ecological interaction, 
except that cattle are confined to fences. They're not these large roaming herds of wild animals, and so therefore there's potential conflict. They can overgraze an area when the animals co-occur together because the prairie dogs, they're sedentary animals. They occur in these colonies, and you can imagine that these cattle are coming into those colonies, and they, can, and they prefer to graze on them, and then that combination of these two major herbivores can have a larger impact on the grassland, particularly when the cattle can't move across right. the greater landscape. What a big difference we can make by putting up a fence, really. It really does come down to overstocking the grassland with too many domestic livestock um, in combination with confining them into within a, a fence landscape. So what exactly are you doing to preserve the, the prairie dog population, or I should say restore it? One of the things we're doing um, at the Seviata National Wildlife Refuge, for example, it's located in central New Mexico. And what is really interesting is I went out with um, the person that was leading the extermination efforts of prairie dogs. So what he told me was that they would go out on horseback with these burlap sacks full of laced grain, and they would sprinkle it across the landscape. Hmm. And the thing about this is that so many animals, from insects to coyotes, like this mm, grain. grain. So you can imagine the widespread indiscriminate <laughs> poisoning mm. that occurred throughout this region and throughout the central grasslands in general, and frankly they still do this. So no matter how you look at it, it's not just poisoning prairie dogs right. or losing the prairie dogs, it's losing that the ecosystem and the species associated with them. Well and how challenging must it be to restore an ecosystem? It's That's the beauty of a keystone species. It's easier to restore a system if you can restore that key component to the ecosystem. And prairie dogs are a key component. Exactly. So that's what our big effort is, to restore the prairie dog and to monitor the uh, response of the community to the restoration of this animal as it um, recolonizes the landscape. But it has been challenging because what we think is going on is with climate change, the region is becoming hotter and drier, droughts are becoming more yeah. frequent and intense, and consequently it's challenging for the reintroductions to be successful. We have to put a sure. lot of effort to keep these animals, um, their populations going and get them well established. We're, we're monitoring the population dynamics over time to see how successful these reintroductions can be, what are the challenges, how do we, what can we yeah. learn from this process to make it successful within this kind of region. What inspired you to go into this line of work? I've always been interested in wildlife um, and conservation, and when I was 18 years old, I was working with the wildlife rescue um, here in New Mexico, and my friends always knew that I was very <laughs> um, into animals and conservation, and I got this phone call from one of my girlfriends. She said, oh my God, Anna, you have to come over <laughs> here. We've got prairie dogs being bulldozed outside my apartment complex. Oh my and, you know, so I go over to this area and I literally see this property with these big bulldozers um, scraping the land surface and literally prairie dogs running from the bulldozers. It was a very powerful experience. And I thought, well, what can I do? Oh, my God. And so I'm trying to call whatever resources I could think of to get people involved. And there was a woman that was um, involved and started Prairie Dog Pals of Albuquerque uh, at the time. And, and she came over to help rescue the prairie dogs. And that's what got me involved in starting to um, do the relocations and restorations. But the other thing is I was in... Um, I was an undergraduate in the biology program and still trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do. And I started exploring the ecological role of prairie dogs, trying to read about them. And I'm learning that they are so important in these ecosystems. But Who also, knew? <laughs> exactly, that's what people are really starting to discover is how important they are to grassland ecosystems. But then I also learned how hated they are as well. Yeah. So what Rodents. I... 
what I realize, exactly, they're vermin, they're rodents, rodents yeah. so, you know, or that's what they're thought of. So they're, what I realize is they're among the most important, but yet among the most hated animals. And so we, I figured they had one of the biggest challenges to overcome in conservation. They parallel the story of wolves. Same thing. They're among the most important in these ecosystems, but also among the most hated. And so there's a huge conservation challenge. Sure. Um, and so that's what got me into um, studying prairie dogs. That's great. And a great reason, too. Friend of prairie dogs. Dr. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. I expect it to be some. That's. And, uh, and we're going to go right into that, too, if you don't mind. I mean, to the. Joining me now is Elizabeth Dirk. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, uh, is medicine being redefined? Tissue engineering is a new era in medicine. It brings together people from lots of different sciences and engineering and medicine to approach problems in medicine in a new way. And right now, a lot of times, foreign materials are used to replace what's missing. Um, we want to shift that towards regeneration of living natural tissue. And so we want to be able to grow tissue that's going to integrate in with the surrounding tissue and grow and repair with the patient over time. And how that works is we take cells from the patient and we put them in a three-dimensional scaffold um, that defines the shape and size of the tissue we want to regenerate and sometimes add biomolecules that are normally found during wound healing and combined, um, they can help regeneration um, of, like I said, functional living tissue. It sounds so futuristic, you know. Are we looking at a new a way to grow new bone? Is that what you're talking about, basically? Exactly. So the body has the ability to repair. If you fall down and break your arm, it's going to heal. If we put these three-dimensional scaffolds in that give the cells um, of the body something to grow in on, and some of the factors normally found during wound healing, then you can basically trick the body into growing little bits of bone until it spanned a very large distance. So it's a three-dimensional scaffolding. When I think of scaffolding, I'm thinking of stuff that's supporting construction or remodeling of a building. Is it similar to that, but in the body? It's the same idea. Oh, wow. What we're looking for is temporary scaffolding to kind of take up the area of a defect. And as the tissue grows in, that scaffolding isn't needed for support anymore, and ideally it would degrade away, so you're left with natural functioning tissue. I love the idea of using the body to actually repair itself. What about a replacement for a defective heart valve? Not as much is known about the cells of the heart valve. Heart valve disease, which is the stiffening of the heart valve, so it's just lots of extra tissue is made. They don't know how that starts and how it progresses. And so some of the research we work on relates to tissue engineering because if we can understand how the body creates all this extra tissue during disease, maybe we can harvest that information and use it to make just enough functional tissue. How does material design fit into your work? In recent years it's been shown that the scaffold actually plays an important part in directing cell function. The cell actually reaches out and pulls on materials around it and if it can pull easily, because it's squishy, then it's going to express some genes. If it's really stiff and can't pull very well, then it's going to express other genes. So we look at developing new materials with different material properties, like different stiffnesses, to help direct the cell function. There's a lot of aspects to the research you're doing. The tissue engineering is very multidisciplinary, and it's it's even defined as bringing engineering problem solving and life sciences problem solving to medical issues. To really do tissue engineering, you need to bring together a group of engineers, of chemists, um, of biologists, of medical doctors, all need to be involved in all stages of the research so you get to a product that's going to be useful to the medical community. My background is in chemical engineering and then biomedical engineering. I currently have students with backgrounds in chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry, biology, biochemistry, and they all work together on different aspects of tissue engineering projects. 
What do you think makes your research at UNM so unique in this area? We're really interested in using the materials instead of the biofactors um, to direct cell function. That kind of makes us on the cutting edge. Another area that makes us very unique is a lot of people use kind of the off-the-shelf materials. And there are a number of materials already proven to work well in biological systems, but they don't actually fit the bill for the, for the given application. And what we do is we go back to the drawing board and say, okay, exactly what properties do we want this to have? What chemical properties, what physical properties? And then we design our materials basically molecule by molecule um, to get our desired property for a given application. So why stem cells? Where, where do the stem cells come from? The players that make the tissue are the cells. And so the choice of cell is very important in developing a tissue en engineered project. And stem cells are great cells. Everybody has them. They're prevalent during development, but adults have them as well. And they're basically cells that haven't committed to what they want to be when they grow up. Mm. They haven't committed to what they're going to do. And so if you have a source of stem cells, then you can make them and direct them to become any type of tissue that you want. Wow. So if I can get a population of stem cells, I can you know, direct them to become bone and help form bone, or I can direct them to become part of the heart or part of the heart valve and make heart valve tissue for us. And so they're very multifunctional. So how close are we then to having a bone or a, or a heart product for use in human clinical trials at this point? The bone is definitely closer to clinical trials. On the heart valve, like I said, there's still a fair amount of basic science that needs to be done. How close? <laughs> I hope to see uh, products that, that I've seen developed used in my lifetime. Tissue engineering products are new. Scientists and lawmakers and the FDA have to work together to figure out how to approve them, how to make sure that they are safe for human use. What's your inspiration for this? So th there's a few key points in my life that brought me to this point. Um, when I was in high school, I was really good at biology, but I loved physics. And I had a teacher who said, you should be an engineer. Mm. And I believed him. <laughs> and so good for that okay. teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I went to college, I said, okay, I want to do engineering and biological systems. Then I had a friend um, who he was actually on his way to the Olympics on the Olympic cycling team. And he got a really bad tear in the cartilage in his knee. Oh, he went to the doctor. They took all the cartilage in his knee out. They said, by the time you're 40, you won't be able to walk very well. So that's it. You know, your Olympic career is over. And at the same time, tissue engineering was just starting to make it into the news. And I turned to my friend and said, one day I'm going to make materials that are going to help you. So is tissue engineering and regenerative medicine the next big step for medicine? You know, they're, they're big problems that we're looking at. And medical doctors are, are very smart, and, but they have a certain problem-solving technique. You know, bring in engineers, we think a very different way, and we look at problems in a different way. Bringing all these different people together with all these different abilities is going to answer problems that alone we couldn't have done. Thank you so much. This is an interesting topic. Appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you for having me. We've designed a program that prepares students for a career in engineering, using the race car as a focus. Why a race car? Because it's a nice set of requirements that the students can design to. And our program in designing the vehicle has been very evolutionary. We usually take on two to three new facets in designing the vehicle each year. We're preparing the students for a hands-on experience that when they go out in the industry, it will be similar in organizational structure. What this course does is teach the soft skills, communication, writing, briefing your, your design to, to your peers, organizing your work over a year and a half time period instead of the homework is due tomorrow. Now the students dictate the pace and have to lay out the complete project. What brings all of this together? 
is a team leader. My responsibility is including keeping all the different parties of the team on task and focused towards the final goal of having a completed car, or having a competitive car for the competition. And the way we structured that was similar to that of a small business in that we have different sub-managers underneath of me who are in charge of each of their own different tasks. And then my job is to evaluate all of the input from those different people, keeping an eye on cost, schedule, performance, and risk management. As project manager, I, my job is to be there for my team. Whatever they need, I need to supply it. I have a team that counts on me, and I care because this affects not only my own career and future aspirations, but my team as well. This is a project like any other engineering firm would have, in that you have a set goal. This is what you want to achieve. You want to have a competitive race car by June. Personally, my career goals were to use this as a stepping stone to gain more valuable experience on an engineering project and as a leader. It's the experience of being on a team and having those soft skills that gives the FSC team members an edge.